So, some of the latest work from my uh, PhD. Um, I'm not going to overblow it or oversell anything like some people in this crowd. <coughs> Tom Clements uh, with his Tully monster. Where is it? Oh, he's gone. Damn. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've just been investigating whether or not there was like a secret or a hidden mass extinction uh, of the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. It was about 145 million years ago. Um, our focus group was tetrapods because I'm part of the tetrapod paleobiology research group. Um, so just kicking things off, thanks to Graham and John Alroy for teaching me how to code. Uh, my supervisors for putting up with me and anyone who's ever contributed data to the PBDB or given me money. Um, so it's a bit of history for starters. So like in the uh, kind of mid uh, 20th century, like the 1950s and 60s, there was sort of a revolution in how we think about paleontology. Um, and there was some inspiring work by guys like uh, Newell, Ralph and Sapkowski, who all started to look at you know, uh, long-term trends on the fossil record and pretty much set up the foundation for modern analytical paleobiology. Um, and regarding the JK Bannon, some of the images that came out really um, But the JK Bannon, the trust station Bannon is here, and you can see that they originally considered to be a major extinction, but not quite on the same level as like, the big fight that we're more familiar with. And this is largely based on uh, various uh, iterations of the Sapkowski compendium, uh, it's a marine animal uh, compendium based on usually brain injury data. And even back in these, uh, these early uh, studies, you know, they, they understood the general con controls and limitations of the record. So for example, again, again the pioneer study by Mr. Rouse, uh, he recognized that the amount of rock which he has reserved in the geological record changes through time. And there's a structural consequences on how we interpret the fossil record. But these evaluations are at a very coarse level. And they didn't really ever explicitly discuss what happened at the JK boundary. And the most, I guess, the nail in the coffin, really, for research around this time was this paper in Nature by Mr. Hallam in 1986. And he essentially said, it's not a mass extinction, it's not even a really interesting extinction, it's just a localized event in some marine industrial groups uh, constrained mostly to Europe. And it's caused by regional changes in fashion shifts, which previously masqueraded themselves as a potential major extinction, but are really just an artifact of the fossil record. So, since 1986, not really much happened. Um, we've been in the dead zone. Um, even in Bambach's seminal paper in 2006, where a review of all the major extinctions, he only considered the, a major extinction on the level of about 20% of extinction in marine invertebrates again. But really, there's been extremely little focused research um, on the JK boundary, despite potentially interesting things happening there in a pretty rich early history. But more recently, we've uh, developed our understanding, I guess, of the constraints of the fossil record, building on this work by like Rav Sapkowski et al. And we now know that uh, we can't take raw diversity and extinction measures and stuff at face value, because there are, there's uh, a very well structured, um, a very good structure, a very well defined structure to, to the fossil record based on principles of macro stratigraphy and things like that. So the way in which we estimate diversity is based on how we've sampled from a very well-structured, um, spatially, temporally varying uh, geological record. And we're beginning to just be, uh, have like me new methods now to kind of unpick these, these uh, potential, what some people call sampling biases, the more just, uh, you know, structures, you know, the variations um, which impose a bias. So in a great piece of work by Smith and McGowan in 2007, they, you know, they built on these principles and they looked at the Western European fossil record again for marine invertebrates and found again at the JK boundary, um, any sort of postulated extinction event is actually just an artifact of the fossil record. And again, you know, JK boundary largely ignored throughout the study and no one's ever really considered it too much in passing. But recently, uh, again in tetrapods, there's been a bit more understanding of what we've, uh, you know, a new level of um, integrating some of this uh, new understanding of. Uh, Biases in the fossil record. So again, this is kind of really If you look at things like uh, Bonzati et al., looking at crocodiles, you see that we have the radiation of uh, two major plates, including the group which led to the modern crown group in crocodiles. If you look in theropods, we see a diverse basal theropod form of like mid to uh, medium sized uh, theropods, and they all seem to go at the same time. These are families like Allosauridae and uh, other fairly basal groups. In mammals, we don't see much of this, uh, using a subtitle of the SQS, which I'll go a bit later. We actually see a, diverse in, uh, a diversity increase across the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. So there's different things going on at different levels and a lot of inconsistency. And along with this, you also, if you look at some molecular data as well, like, then you see 
that we have adaptive radiations in groups like lizard billions and sharks and various other vertebrate faunas around this time. So there's a kind of hint that there might have been a faunal or ecological turnover at this time, but no one's really quantified it before. And it's very similar in the Marine Room, too. If we look at uh, matters uh, employed by modern medical Butler, they found using the residual method, which uh, corrects the sampling to some degree, that there was a major extinction across the JK boundary in all marine central populations. This hasn't really been supported though, by most recent studies. And if you look at other groups like turtles, again, we actually see a, uh, a geographically structured radiation of turtles across the JK boundary. So there's conflicting evidence again what's going through. Yeah. So, I'll finally get to some actual research. Uh, can we quantify changes uh, in diversity across the JK boundary? What is the structure that is defining these changes? How do we account for sample bias and uh, things like that? And then what are the external parameters that are driving this? What, what are the selectivity processes that are responsible for mediating or regulating these diversity patterns? So we used the uh, now fully functional PBDB. There's been hiccups in the past with it, which I'm sure we're all aware of. But I guess for the tetrapolis counts as reasonably big data, like you've got 15,500 taxon occurrences representing the 5,000 species across the Jurassic Cages interval. And we split this into irregular life cycle groups, so sort of uh, crocodiles, mammals, amphibians, blah blah blah, all the usual uh, tetrapod groups. And there's what we you know, split them into whether they were fully aquatic or non marine or not. And approximately equal paleocontinental areas too, so we discarded data from places like Japan or India because they violate some of the assumptions when you apply some of these methods. And also explore the, the change, uh, the impact of different time binning methods. What these things, so the way in which these methods work is, is essentially counting through time and depending on the temporal structure of the fossil record that influences what you're counting and how much you're counting. So, yeah, we uh, looked at that as well. So we used everyone's favourite method, SQS, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times today. It's essentially a method that was designed to account for heterogeneous sampling based on um, collection, so how humans have sampled the fossil record. It actually, when John developed this method, he almost ignored all the current research which we've been doing as geologists about the geological structure of the record. And um, apply some simple maximum likelihood monitoring techniques, calculated some extinction regulation rates, and gathered some uh, geological sampling proxies and things like that. And collect, uh, these are things that measure or can be used as proxies for how well we've sampled the fossil record, for example, and the number of collections, or uh, the amount of rock available for sampling, such as like the number of tetrapod bearing formations. So this is what the raw data looks like. It's pretty patchy in, in the Jurassic. Um, and much more density sound in the Cretaceous, which is great. And if you just look at the raw empirical diversity, which is a very, very bad thing to do, you see that there might be an extinction in all tetrapod groups. But is it an artifact, yay or nay? <coughs> One interesting thing is uh, that ter terrestrial diversity is consistently higher than marine diversity. And I don't know if anyone's ever looked into why that might be, but that would be cool to do in the future. But when you apply subsampling techniques anyway, you get a completely different picture of it. So if you look at dinosaurs, for example, in uh, theropods, uh, I don't know how late you see this, the little blue circles, um, they have a radiation in the Tithonium, and they cross the JK boundary, they suffer about 85% decrease in diversity. So this has never been picked up before by any constant analogy, really. Uh, at least it doesn't matter to you. If you look at sauropods, they have a double dip recession, so they're the usual kind of oxygen radiation. Um, and then they get, oh no, sorry, it's called oxygen extinction, they recover the and get hit again into thonium. Unfortunately, that fossil record in the variation is pretty f***ed. <laughs> it's impacted. Uh, so we don't actually know what happens in the bone bound, but what we can say is that when we recover a signal again in the, uh, in the Dallin Junior, the diversity is substantially lower than it was when we can measure the latest Jurassic. And it's the same for one fish, you can see the hit, they have another double dip. Uh, where are they? Yeah, they, they suffer a bit, just fairly flat in the latest Jurassic. And then in the early Cretaceous, they get hit twice, so there's two kind of pulses of diversity loss. But then we, we see a radiation in new groups, such as the maps like the company, the organs of uh, the radiation of ceratopsins and pilosaurs, can be dated to around this time. And we see that reflected in these diversity increases. If we look in uh, other groups as well, we see you know, a, a very weird pattern again. We see increasing diversity consistently throughout the latest uh, Jurassic, apart from in groups like um, pterosaurs that suffer a slight decline. Terrorism, again, unfortunately, two poorly sampled in the early Cretaceous and then what happens. But when we again do recover a signal in the host river, it's consistently low. I should mention that these numbers on the left aren't absolute, they're relative uh, proportions. 
of uh, diverting through time. So when it's uh, you know when we see six compared to two, that doesn't mean there's four more taxa. It means there's three times as many taxa in that bit. Either way, what we're saying again is almost every group suffering an extinction of moderate magnitude across the JJ boundary, followed by um, a radiation of not just uh, increasing diversity, but also new, new major clades, many of which are still around today. <clears throat> if you look at smaller critters, um, fossil record is pretty terrible from that day, so if you like this amphibian, we don't really know what happened. Um, we know there's amphibian diversity around the time was lower than pretty much any other group, unfortunately. Um, but mammals and the beetles both seem to get hit after the boundary. So not through the boundary, but it's, they actually are, in some cases, map. Uh, they actually increase in diversity through the boundary and they get hit after. So there's no temporally synchronous event happening here. It's, it does, you know, extinctions happening before the boundary, uh, through the boundary, and after the boundary too. So it's like this wave or pulse of, of uh, extinction. And we see the same with marine mammals too. Woohoo! Shocking. Um, sea level goes up, marine uh, touch point diversity goes up. Sea level goes down, which we do see there's a, a, a large um, Eurobatic change, typically in Europe at the time. We see a major global sea level regression, which manifests itself best in Western Europe. And with that, we see the contraction of shallow marine basins and a reduction in diversity in the marine groups across the JK Valley. <coughs> and if you, um, so if you consider diversity as the standing product of both extinction and speciation, then you kind of have to pull these components apart to figure out why your diversity is changing over. So if you look at three time extinction rates, again in our own method, that accounts for the single lips effect of artificial truncation of lineages, then we actually see highly elevated extinction rates in almost all the groups at the end of the Jurassic and the Thomian. And this is actually some of the highest rates you see throughout the entire Jurassic and the that we just didn't analyze them while stricting because that's another PhD. And as so well as that, what we see with origination rates, so speciation rates, they're highly suppressed throughout the uh, early Cretaceous. So there's not really much going on right after the boundary. So it's like a delayed recovery after this, uh, this moderate extinction. And importantly as well, even groups which, such, which have massive radiation in the latest Jurassic, um, despite being so diverse, it didn't seem to confer any sort of survival advantage on them at all, and we still got hit pretty hard by extinction. Well, like, if we look at the regional structure of this, most of it seems to be confined to the Northern Hemisphere. Cold in terms of fossils in uh, South America and Africa, which sucks. And if you go to North America, for example, it's things are a bit, a bit weird. So you have a continuous uh, rock record. This, these are uh, data from uh, Peaks in 2011, and they show that there's a continuous macroscopic record throughout the JK Boundary. So if we actually look at the fossil record, there's just nothing. So are we seeing um, a lack of preservation of fasces, which these things were, uh, will be found in? Are we seeing uh, actual extinction in North America? And then when land bridges re emerge in the early Cretaceous, we start seeing repopulation of the landmass. Okay, cool. Right. Go fast. <coughs> and we see a similar signal in Europe. Continuous rock record sequence and um, discontinuous uh, oh, biological record or fossil record. So we can say that the, uh, the extinction, which we postulate to be mostly in Europe, is probably not an artifact of the rock record because if it was, we'd expect to see discrepancies. Importantly, like when you start looking at these sampling proxies, Almost in every single case for every touch board group, raw diversity, raw empirical diversity, Mr. Benton's favourite, is strongly correlated with almost every single sample of crops you throw at it. So it's a very strong uh, support for this redundancy hypothesis where you have non independence between your sampling metric and your diversity count. So raw diversity, very, very bad. But weirdly, when you apply sub sampling, uh, again on the global level, and then re perform these calculations, those relationships break down in every single circumstance. If you throw formations at it, collections at it, outcrop area, at different taxonomic levels to account for potential redundancy and things like that, the relationships break down entirely. Apart from the theropods, in which case the, uh, the adjusted p-value remains significant, everyone's uh, favorite thing. And we think this is because theropods are essentially so ubiquitous about the fossil record that they're just everywhere. So I've got to accelerate. Um, and in Europe, we find evidence for raw richness again being driven by things like outcrop area, whereas in North America, we find more like sea level controls and stratigraphy, which imposes itself on diversity. And so this discontinuous um, thing we're seeing in North America might simply be due to changes in sea level at the time. And then we're getting a common cause hypothesis there where sea level is driving both sampling and diversity. So like, if we acknowledge that S stress is accounted for these sampling biases then, and is a good measure of diversity, then we start throwing other things at it and see what's governing diversity in terms of environmental factors. 
And in almost every case, this is the sea level, apart from some groups where paleo temperature comes out as the dominant factor in calling um, diversity through this period. And this makes sense. We have a sea level regression, it contracts on every basis, it changes your initial habitats, and you get a diversity loss. <coughs> so, conclusions we've got a formal turnover, pretty much focused in Europe, but in both marine and non marine realms. It's very variable, it's like this pulse or wave of extinction, and it seems to have been driven by changes in sea level. And if we consider the broader context of these things, then it fits in very well with what we know about marine invertebrates and microorganisms at the time, which suffer like a marine revolution of some sort. Uh, and then the extinction of low latitude shelf dwelling faunas, mostly around Europe. But as well as, uh, I'll finish in a second. Like, we cannot rule out singular catastrophic events. Like, one of the great things about the KT boundary is that it's a globally um, recognizable stratigraphic uh, market. We don't really have anything like that at the JK boundary, but what we do have are three bowline impacts which hit at the same time. One of them which was bigger than the, uh, than the Yucatan Peninsula meteor when it hit. We also have the single largest volcano on, on Earth going off smack bang at the JK boundary, the Shatsky Rise. But in the earliest Cretaceous, we have two of the largest volcanic provinces ever. One is 50 times the volume of Deccan Trebs going off, right? So there's a lot more interesting stuff going on around here, but we can't stratigraph, uh, we can't statistically check anything. So, and with that, I'll leave. Yeah. <laughs>